So what we have in front of us here looks like a pretty bare airport. I know it looks just like an airport, right? My, my drawing skills are absolutely miraculous, I know. Um, anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to add some more markings and components to this airport to make it look more like an airport. So the first thing we're going to add is this marking at each end of each runway. So what this is called is a threshold. And the threshold marks the area of the runway that is safe for both takeoff and landing. So it's made up of the lines that run down the runway for a certain distance and then a line that runs across the runway. A lot of smaller runways may not have a threshold or they may have just the line that runs across or whatever, but we're going to stick to runways that have this style of threshold with the set of lines that runs down for a certain distance and then the one that runs across. Simplest and it's the most common. So if we look here at the bottom runway, the one that runs all the way across the bottom of the screen, we can see that that runway has 12 lines that run down the runway and then one that runs across. So the 12 that run down, that represents that there are 150 feet of width for that runway, not length but width. That's how wide the runway is. And then on these smaller ones in the middle of the field, we can see that they both have six lines each. And that represents that they are 75 feet wide. So obviously you can kind of get the trend here. Each line represents a certain amount of feet. I don't know how many feet off the top of my head. Um, I guess you could take 75 and divide it by 6, but I'm not very good at math, so I, I'm not going to do that. But you get the point. Now, in some cases, the threshold may not be at the very end of the runway. Now, we can see a couple of examples here right on the screen. So, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those examples. We're going to add a few more markings to them first, and we're going to go over them. So, this area right here, circled in blue, is called a blast pad. Now, a blast pad is basically a part of concrete or asphalt or some sort of pavement that protects the earth below it from jet blast or prop wash or whatever. Now blast pads you are not allowed to operate any aircraft or vehicles on. They are not safe. In fact they could crumble if you drove on them. So you cannot taxi or drive or anything on the blast pad. But the blast pad is designed to protect the earth below um, where it is. So as you can see here, if someone's trying to take off on this runway and they put their engines all the way up to full, that's going to create a lot of wind behind them which could blow all the dirt out from under this taxiway right behind the runway and we don't want that to happen, that would not be good. So obviously I was very smart and I drew a blast pad in here so that wouldn't happen. Um, so that's basically what a blast pad is, and in some cases there's a special kind of blast pad. I don't remember the name of it, I guess I could maybe put it up on the screen, um, and you can look it up yourself. And basically what it is, it, it's not just a blast pad, but if someone was landing on the other end of the runway, on the right side of the runway, our right, they are landing here and then they can't stop in time and they accidentally overshoot the runway, the blast pad, like I said, it's usually not strong enough to support the weight of vehicles. It will crumble, and some are designed to crumble to stop the airplane from going any further off the end of the runway. So that's pretty smart if you ask me. The other thing you might find on a runway prior to a threshold is what's called a displaced threshold. Now there are two main reasons that a displaced threshold would be constructed. The main reason would be because there's some sort of obstruction on the approach path to the runway, maybe terrain or a building of some sort or something like that, and it requires the pilot to land later down the runway instead of right at the end. So a displaced threshold is safe for takeoff, but obviously not for landing. The other reason why you might have a displaced threshold is not because of obstructions, but it might be because the earth underneath is not strong enough to support the continuous force of airplanes landing on it all the time. Um, you might ask, well, why would they build a runway there? Well, it's because usually in on islands or something, you might have to build a runway next to a cliff or something like that. And if 
your cliff is easy to erode, then planes landing on it all the time might not be a good idea, and you might want to land the airplanes further down the runway, more inland from that cliff. So those are the main reasons why you'd have a displaced threshold. And one note to make is that it is possible to have both a displaced threshold and a blast pad, but the blast pad will always come before the displaced threshold. So the order it would go in is uh, blast pad, displaced threshold, and then threshold. The last marking we're going to look at before moving along is the taxiway center line. Now the taxiway center line obviously runs along the center of a taxiway and it helps pilots not veer off left or right when they're taxiing, possibly in the dark or the rain or what have you. You may also notice that um, for most runways the taxiway center line will extend onto the runway at a taxiway intersection for a certain distance to help pilots um, taxi on and line up for takeoff or exit the runway after they've landed. In addition to that, you may notice on the runway that runs sort of north-south here, the smaller one, you can see at the north end we have what's called a turnaround bay. So that is because there's no taxiway that connects to the end of that runway, so what planes would have to do is enter the runway from the nearest taxiway, taxi along the runway, and use that turnaround bay to turn around, and then take off, or if they've just landed, they'd turn around and taxi back. Whatever the situation might be, that's what that's for, and they will usually have, you could call it a taxiway center line or just a guidance line to help them turn around in that turnaround bay. The next marking we are going to take a look at is probably one of the most important a pilot can know, and that is the hold short marking. Now, hold short basically just means stop before you cross a runway or a taxiway or what have you. So, runway hold short markings look like this. They have two solid lines and two dash lines arranged like so. And if you are on the side where the solid lines are facing you, then you have to stop before you cross that line. If you are on the side with the dashed lines, you are permitted to cross that without any sort of clearance from air traffic control. Now, the next sort of hold short marking you're going to see is a taxiway hold short. So, you don't have to stop at these at all unless instructed specifically by air traffic control, and it's simply just a dashed single line here. The next thing we're going to look at is the markings that come along with runway hold short markings and that is going to be usually two boxes with numbers in them. The boxes will always be red and the numbers will always be white. Now these numbers are the numbers of the runway that the taxiway is crossing. We're going to get to how they number runways shortly but I'll just basically tell you what's going on with this. Uh, this would indicate here that the 1-5 end of the runway, so the runway number 1-5 is to your left and the runway number 3-3 three three is to the right. In addition to that, you might find um, hold short markings with numbers like this, but this is not a number, this is like the word approach. Now what that means is that the taxiway that you are stopped on does not actually cross the runway, but it is close enough to the end of the runway that you still have to stop. So approach means that the planes that could be approaching on this runway 1-5 will be too low to clear you if you're underneath them. So you will have to hold short of these unless ATC clears you across them. The next marking we're going to look at is called the taxiway edge line. Basically similar to the taxiway center line which prevents planes from veering off the center. The taxiway edge line basically shows the edge of the taxiway so where you do not want to go past if you're taxiing along. In addition to that, we also have these areas here which are green with yellow ticks around them. These are basically just areas where planes, vehicles, and whatnot are not allowed to taxi on whatsoever. Sort of like a blast pad where it could be unstable underneath and you don't want to taxi on it because it could crumble. Or it's just they don't want you taxiing there 
and then they have the bright green and then the yellow ticks around just to emphasize you're not supposed to be going in here. The next marking we're going to take a look at is another sort of hold short marking. This is what's called an ILS holding point. We're going to talk about what ILS means as well soon, but basically you don't have to hold short of these unless instructed to specifically by air traffic control. So an ILS basically is a signal that's sent out by an antenna on the ground to planes approaching the airport. And if a plane happens to interrupt that signal, it can cause a lot of problems. So what an ILS holding point does is it prevents planes from interrupting that signal. Along with ILS holding points, you are going to find another red box simply with the letters ILS. The next marking we're going to take a look at are Enhanced Taxiway Center Lines. What a name. Um, basically, you're going to find these prior to runway hold short markings. And it's just going to be the hold short marking here, as you can see, the taxiway center line. And then on either side of the taxiway center line, you're going to have these dashed lines. And that's what's called an enhanced taxiway center line. And what they do is they simply uh, make sure that pilots are aware that they're approaching a hold short marking and that they can slow down and get ready to stop before they cross it accidentally or whatever. The next thing we're going to take a look at are taxiway signs. Very briefly we're going to take a look at this. Um, now you might find these painted on the taxiways themselves like the hold short markings and the signs that come along with them but it's more likely that you'll find these as actual signs planted in the ground next to the taxiways. So there are two main kinds of signs that you're going to have. Uh, that'll be um, location signs and direction signs. So obviously as I've written up here on the screen, uh, yellow text with a black background will be location signs. So if you see um, a location sign, uh, like the one here, we have A, or as they say in aviation, Alpha. If you have one that says Alpha, that is where you are. So that means if you see this sign, you are on taxiway Alpha. Every taxiway has a letter that is assigned to it, just like every runway has a number that's assigned to it. So if you're on taxiway Alpha and you come up to an intersection and you see this yellow sign with black text on it, that says Bravo with an arrow pointing, that means that you are on taxiway Alpha and the next intersection is going to be taxiway Bravo. So when air traffic control tells you taxi to this runway via Alpha and Bravo, then you need to follow these signs to know where you're going. And then here, this is basically just some of the locations that you would find taxiway signs at. The next thing we're going to take a look at here are runway numbers. Now, you might think they're assigned randomly, but I assure you they're not. There's a very good, efficient, and I think pretty clever system uh, for assigning runway numbers, and that is depending on their magnetic heading on a compass rose. So obviously a compass has, you know, directions north, south, east, and west, but you may not know that a compass also has numerical headings associated with those directions. So if we say north is 0 degrees or 360 degrees and then we turn 90 degrees to the right you might know that as a right angle if you paid attention in your geometry class. So then we're going to have 0, 090 0 degrees. So then we turn another 90 degrees and then we're going to get 180. So that's 180 degrees from our original 360 degrees or you know our 360 is a full circle, right? So then if we turn another 90, we're going to get 270, and then you turn the last 90, and then there you are at 360 again, and that's your compass. So you might notice here for the numbers that we've painted on the runway themselves, uh, we've got, if you look at the top one there on the left, it says 09L, and then the um, smaller one that runs in the same direction as that one is 09C and then the one at the very bottom on the left there it says 09R. Now you might pick up by now that the 09 is coming from the heading 090 as you can see on the compass but the L, C and R you might not know what that is but that is another clever system 
Since these three runways are running parallel to each other, the L is for left, the R is for right, and the C is for center. Because they all have the exact same heading, they all need to be different assigned runways. So that is how they do it. Left, right, and center, and then the heading. Obviously, for runways that don't have parallel runways, like this 1533 runway here, that is just 15 and 33. There's no left, right, or center for that. The next thing we're going to take a look at is the runway center line. Um, surprisingly, wow, it runs down the center of the runway. Um, but it actually does come in real handy for pilots because when it's dark out or it's raining or whatever, you can't really see where you're going. And a big line down the middle of where you're supposed to be going really can help. Uh, it helps pilots also from a distance when they're approaching to know where the runway is and where they're supposed to be lined up at um, because parallel taxiways from far away can look like runways or whatever but with all your taxiway markings being yellow and all your runway markings being white it really does help identify which is the runway and which is the taxiway and where you're supposed to be landing. So basically it's just a white dashed line down the middle of the runway. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, at some airports, not all, um, the runway markings, that includes the center line, the threshold, and then a few others that we're going to look at in a minute, um, might be made up of smaller little lines like this clumped together to make the actual marking. This is to prevent cracking in the pavement because when you put a big glob of paint on the pavement it can crack when the weather changes or whatever. I think it kind of looks like a barcode. That's a good way to put it, I guess. I don't know if me describing it is really working, but I, I would say to describe it, it looks like a barcode. Anyway, the next thing we're going to look at is called the aim point marker. Uh, this is placed 1,000 feet from the threshold of the runway. Not all runways will have it. Smaller runways probably won't, like our smaller ones here don't. Uh, but our larger ones do. Uh, like I said, they're placed 1,000 feet from the threshold of the runway. And basically, this is what, when pilots are on approach, this is what they're going to be looking for. And they are going to try to touch down basically on this marking or just before or just after it. The next marking we're going to look at is called the touchdown zone markings. Again, not all runways will have it. This kind of goes along with the aim point marker. The aim point marker is what you're aiming for, like because it's really big and you can see it from miles away. And then the touchdown zone markers are basically where you're supposed to be touching down. So really you could be touching down anywhere from the threshold to the last touchdown zone marker as shown here in the blue at the top. The next marking we're going to look at is the runway edge markings. Similar to the taxiway edge markings except it's for a runway. So it's basically just one single white line along the edge of the runway. Same purpose as the taxiway one, just to prevent people from veering off the runway. The next thing we're going to look at are simply just wind socks. Um, the fancy name for them is wind direction indicators. There's a couple of different ways that you can measure wind on an airfield, but we're going to go with the uh, most simple and oldest way to do it with a wind sock. So your wind sock is not a proper wind sock unless it has these stripes on it. Now I'm not saying that just because, oh I want fancy stripes they actually serve a pretty interesting purpose. Each one of these stripes represents three knots of wind. That's how we measure wind in aviation or speed in aviation is by knots, not by miles or kilometers per hour. So if each stripe represents three knots, then our wind right now, as shown in the top left, would be probably about zero to four knots of wind. Now if the wind were to pick up, and the next stripe is um, inflated, then this would be about four to seven knots of wind. Again, if the wind picks up, this would be about seven to 11. 
again, 11 to 14. And then if the entire windsock is inflated, that would be over 15 knots. Now, windsocks are placed at strategic positions around an airfield, and the symbol for them on an airport diagram would look like this. If they are unlighted, and then if they are lighted for nighttime use, they would have these three little stripes as well. Now, do keep in mind that big international airports are going to have a lot more efficient systems than just a windsock planted in the ground, um, and the tower they have instruments as well that they will use to tell pilots the wind. The next thing we're going to look at is the ILS, that stands for Instrument Landing System. Sounds pretty cool, so let's get right into it. First thing we're going to do here is zoom out just a little bit, and then we're going to add a couple of antennas, one here at the end of the runway, either end of the runway, and then two more a little bit down the runway, usually next to the aim point marker. Now, keep in mind that every runway, if it's equipped with ILS, will have its own separate ILS, and usually each end of that runway will have its own ILS as well. So we're only going to build one for our northern runway here, and we're going to build one at both ends. Next thing, we're going to zoom out even more, and we're going to draw an imaginary line right down the center line of the runway. In ILS terms, this is called the localizer. Now, the way this works is an ILS, there's a set of frequencies, and I'll put them up on the screen right now, that you can tune in to your navigation radio in your aircraft, and if you've typed it in right, and if you have uh, an autopilot that's capable of following an ILS, your plane will line itself up with the runway. The way that this works is the localizer antenna, the one at the end, emits two lobes of radio waves that are frequency modulated to 150 Hz on the right and 90 Hz on the left. So like I said, it's frequency modulated, which means that they are unique to the ILS frequency that you tuned your navigation radio to. Now, obviously, since we added a localizer antenna at the opposite end of the runway, that end will also have the same thing, just reversed. Usually, the localizer radio waves will extend approximately 10 nautical miles from the threshold of the runway. The next thing we're going to look at here is the other antenna. So what we're going to do is look at the runway sort of from a horizontal perspective. I know this is a terrible drawing, but this is our runway here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to draw another couple of imaginary lines. Now these are called the glide slope lines, and the other antenna, of course, is called the glide slope antenna. So the way this works is usually this glide slope will be 3 to 5 degrees, usually 3, maximum 5, and it's the same way that the localizer antenna works. Uh, there's going to be two lobes, 150 hertz on the top and then 90 hertz on the bottom, and then of course the same on the opposite end. Same with the localizer antenna, it extends approximately 10 nautical miles from the threshold. And of course, these waves, again, like I said, are being emitted by the glide slope antennas next to the runway. Now, of course, keep in mind that an ILS can only run in a straight line, so if there are permanent obstructions such as terrain or infrastructure in the way of the glide slope, you cannot have an ILS. Then you would need what's called RNAV, but that's a completely different video altogether. So here we are in our aircraft getting ready to intercept the localizer and the glide slope for an ILS approach to an airport. The first thing we're going to do is tune the ILS frequency in. In this case it's going to be 110.95. And then once we do that we can see on our display here these two uh, magenta bugs. Now that indicates that should the ILS be tuned correctly, which it is, the ILS is basically ready to use. Now these magenta bugs, they aren't just two dots on a screen, they actually represent something. The one on the right here represents the glide slope, and the one on the bottom represents the localizer. 
So in this case, we can see that we're below the glide slope and to the left of the localizer. So in that case, we're going to have to turn to the right to intercept them. So the first thing we do is set our heading. Probably we would receive a vector from air traffic control for this heading, so we'd turn to it, and then we'd be cleared for the ILS approach by air traffic control. So then we would engage our approach mode. Not every aircraft has an approach mode or even an autopilot, so in some cases you would actually fly the ILS by hand. You're mostly going to see that in smaller uh, general aviation private planes. In this 737, we obviously have an approach mode and an autopilot, so we're going to use that to land the plane today. And then we just have to make a few minor adjustments ourselves, but ultimately the autopilot will land the plane itself. The next thing we're going to take a look at are called PAPI lights, that's spelled P-A-P-I, it stands for Precision Approach Path Indicator. Now the way these work, uh, what you want to see is two white lights and two red lights. Uh, these lights are uh, put next to the runway as we can see here, and the way they work is if you're higher up you'll have white lights and the lower you are you'll have red lights because each light is at a slightly different angle to the ground and they have uh, different lenses on them so that you see different colors the higher or lower you are. So if you have two white and two red, you're right on the glide slope. Too, too much white, check your height, and then too much red and you're dead is the saying that we have in aviation. thing we're going to look at are apron and ramp markings. Uh, you're going to hear apron more in Canada and then ramp more in the US usually, uh, but you can hear either or in either place. Um, now what we're going to do here is we're going to pave this part of the field and build a terminal on top of it. So basically a ramp or an apron is kind of like a parking lot for airplanes. So when you see the planes parked at the gate, that's the ramp or apron. So we're going to add some more markings and components to this, and then we're going to go over what they all mean. I'm going to add some planes to parked at all the gates, and we're going to leave one gate open so we can look at what a gate has. Now this is very simple, just it's very simplified, keep that in mind. Uh, these markings might vary from place to place, airport to airport, but this is basically what you'll find um, on the basic level. So the first thing we're going to have here is the stand marking itself. So basically this is just a line with a couple other lines and the longer line is uh, the line where the plane is supposed to be lined up on and then the smaller line is where the nose wheel is supposed to be stopped at once they are ready to park. If we look closer here we can have uh, our line here and then next to each of those lines usually you're going to find the uh, types of aircraft. So here we have a Dash 8 and a 737. These, and that indicates that uh, these two lines here, um, the corresponding aircraft type, is where that aircraft's nose wheel is supposed to stop. Now obviously they're not going to have every single aircraft in the world labeled on here, but you know each aircraft has a similar aircraft that's similar in size or whatever and uh, this is where they stop. So how do they know where to stop? Um, they would have a marshaller. Now a marshaller would usually stand about here. The marshaller is a real person with um, signals they give to the aircraft on which way to turn until they are lined up with the stand. We're going to talk more about marshallers in a little bit. Next thing we're going to look at is this marking here. Basically this is a taxiway edge marking but it shows the edge of the apron beside it so it's the same as the taxiway edge marking but it's dashed. Next thing we're going to look at is the uh, gate itself. You've probably seen these if you've flown before or if you've been to an airport. Uh, this is the jet bridge I should say, it's not the gate, this is the jet bridge and it obviously can extend in and out to reach the aircraft when it's parked and it's basically so passengers can walk from the aircraft to the terminal or vice versa. And this red box here, basically any red that you see at a stand or gate is essentially an area where you're not supposed to be walking or driving or anything because it's uh, where the jet bridge actually has to maneuver in. 
You might also find on a ramp or apron um, smaller hangers like this, um, but we're actually just going to keep those out for now. Um, but you would find them usually on a ramp or apron, probably not right to the terminal, right next to the terminal like this, but uh, probably on a separate ramp or apron. Next thing we're going to look at is uh, this marking here. You might recognize it from before uh, to show don't taxi here because it's a separation between these two taxiways. The next thing we're going to take a look at are ground marshalling signals. We've talked a little bit about the ground marshaller before, but this is going to be a little more detailed. And do keep in mind that these are really simplified as well. Um, there are a lot more signals than what we're going to be talking about, but these are basically just the ones that um, apply to all aircraft. Like some aircraft, you're going to have signals to start and stop the engines, and some aircraft, you're not going to have that. But this is basically what applies to all aircraft. So basically, um, the ground marshaller is a real person that stands on the apron in front of the plane, and they use hand signals uh, to guide the plane to go left, right, wherever they need the plane to go. You may have seen them if you've been to an airport, and they basically stand, like I said, right at the front of the gate and wave their arms around. We're going to talk though about what um, their signals with their arms and what actually mean. So usually they will be carrying um, these uh, glow sticks with them, or wands, or whatever you want to call them. Um, but they don't always, but most, most places you will have them carrying these. And so basically once the plane is off the taxiway and in front of their gate, air traffic control doesn't have anything to do with them anymore. So the ground marshaller is going to be guiding them until they turn their engines off. So the way they do that, by telling them to move forward along the stand marking, which we have right in front of us, so we're kind of looking from the pilot's view, sort of, uh, the motion for that would be like this, raising the arms up and down. Now what if we were not perfectly aligned on that stand marking? Uh, we need to know how to go left or right, steer left or right. So, the marshaller would give us this signal. And then, once we are aligned again, they will keep going with the forward signal until our nose wheel is lined up with that smaller line, the appropriate one for our aircraft. And then they would give us the stop signal, which looks like this. The next thing we're going to look at are runway and taxiway lights. The three main kinds of lights you're going to find are embedded ones, planted ones, and then raised ones, which are raised on masts like this. Uh, we're going to look at the embedded ones first, so we'll go ahead and move over here. Uh, the main place you're going to find embedded ones are on places where the planes are actually rolling over all the time. You don't want to get the other lights crushed or anything. That's why they're embedded. So mainly you're going to find them in the center of runways and taxiways. So we're going to go ahead and just blur out the field just a little bit so we can see the lights more clearly. And we'll go ahead and add the lights right now. Uh, so you might notice as well we don't have any lights in this part of the field. I did that on purpose. It's not because I was just lazy and didn't put them in. No, uh, smaller airports or uh, less busy areas of an airport might not have lights. So I only put them on the larger sections of the airport. So first thing we'll look at here are the taxiway centerline lights. Uh, they are going to be a single green light that go down the center line of the taxiway. So basically the exact same purpose as the center line itself, just for low visibility at nighttime or raining or whatever. The next thing we're going to look at are the runway center line lights, same thing as the taxiway center line lights, except for the runway. And they are going to be single white lights that run down the center line of the runway. The next thing we'll go ahead and look at here are lead-on lights. They basically follow the taxiway center line onto the runway, and they're going to be alternating yellow and green lights. 
and we'll also go ahead and look at these lights these are basically um, the center line lights but it's for when you are landing at say you landed on the right hand side of the runway here our right and you landed you're going to end up seeing at the other end of the runway the white lights will turn into alternating red and white and then they're going to turn into all red and keep in mind like I said that's only when you are landing from that direction these lights are two-sided so when you're at the other end the left hand end then you are going to see just white. The next thing we'll look at here are the runway end lights. These are basically uh, same thing as before, uh, double sided. So from this side you're going to see red lights and that just marks the end, right? The lights just go straight across at the end. So you can't go any further than that. And then if you're looking from this side you're going to see green lights and you're gonna see again like I said earlier these lights will turn white again. Next thing we'll go ahead and look at are the touchdown zone lights basically the same as the touchdown zone markers except for like I said when it's dark you need lights for that. So here you're gonna see it's rows of three lights on either side of the runway center line and they run from the threshold down to the end of the touchdown zone. Now we'll go ahead and look at these planted lights and you're going to find these probably on the edges of taxiways and runways where the planes aren't actually rolling over top of them. And we're going to go ahead and look at the runway edge lights first. So basically those guys are white lights as well on the edges of the runways. A good way to remember uh, runway lights is that most of them are white just like the markings are mostly white. So basically they just run down the edge of the runway the whole way down and they're all white, they don't change color like the other ones or anything fancy like that. We're also going to look at the taxiway edge lights. These ones are going to be single blue lights in a row all the way down the taxiway edges. And then we'll go ahead and look at the runway end identifier lights. Now these could come in several different variations but this is going to be the most simple. Uh, basically these ones actually flash and you can see them when you're approaching the runway and it really helps to identify the runway when it's dark like the end of the runway so they both flash together um, simultaneously and they keep flashing and then that really helps identify the runway next thing we'll do is we'll go sort of more off the end of the runway and we'll look at the approach lights so that's going to be these guys here the raised up ones you're going to find them in this area uh, about probably anywhere from 500 to 2,500 feet from the end of the runway. So we'll go ahead and build them right here. So, I mean, it's a pretty wild, just perfect drawing, right? I know, it's great. Anyway, um, basically the line is supposed to be the mast and then the little circles are the lights, obviously. I, I'm sure you don't mind my terrible drawing. I'm just here to learn, so that I'm, I, hope, I hope I can teach you some. Anyway, basically these lights are going to be the um, runway, like the extended runway center line lights. So basically they are perfectly aligned with the runway center line and they guide you down to the runway. These lights here are going to be called the decision bar. So basically once the aircraft is over these, it's the pilot's decision to either continue with the landing or go around and try again for another approach if they're unstable or for whatever reason. Now these lights here, these ones are going to flash in succession like this arrow is moving to the decision bar. Now that also helps to identify the runway and the center line.
Thank you.